Hello everyone, I am Swami Joshi from Make Medical Easy team and I am a third first medical student from Jimar Sola, Ahmedabad and now we will be discussing the reproductive system. We are going to implement an integrated way of teaching the way uh, the USMLE step 1 wants you to know a particular system that is first of all you will be covering the embryology section then the anatomy then the physiology pathology and the pharmacology of that particular system. So this will be a series of videos and we will be starting uh, the series with the lecture of embryology. So let's begin. Uh, and uh, for what I was studying uh, these many hours uh, relentlessly, it's just that one day we can save someone's life. So it's always a beautiful day to sa save lives and let's have some fun. So for the embryology section, we will be starting our discussion with the embryonic genes. So uh, whenever uh, the embryo has, uh, whenever the embryo has formed, now for example, this dot is an embryo, right? So various genes are required for the development of our body in a particular direction. So the, the important genes which our body needs uh, is the sonic hedgehog, the FGA, which is the fibroblast growth factor, WNT7A gene and the homeobox gene. Now all these genes have, have uh, a particular task to uh, pattern the body in a particular way. Like for example, uh, the development of our body occurs we, uh, either in the anterior posterior way which is the AP way. It can either be in the dorsal ventral which is the DV way. It can be proximal distal which is the PD way. So there are, there are three ways in which our body needs to be patterned uh, so that our body can grow properly. So, so the first one gene that we'll be talking about is basically the sonic hedgehog. So what does a sonic hedgehog do? Like it is, uh, you know, very much clear from the diagrams that I have inserted over here. Sonic hedgehog is a signaling protein, first of all. It is a signaling protein. And sonic hedgehog is main, it has the main important role of the CNS development. Now here what you can see, this is the pathology that we are seeing. But first of all, let's talk about the normal thing that what does, uh, what does sonic hedgehog wants to do. So basically, this is my one hemisphere of the brain and this is the second hemisphere of the brain. So basically between these two uh, hemispheres, there is a midline like section. Okay, although here it looks like it, is, it has been cut into two halves, but I am trying to show you over here the midline. So this midline is formed by the sonic hedgehog so that both the hemisphere gets connected to each other. So if the sonic hedgehog gene is absent, then it will cause the pathology of holoprosencephaly. So these diagrams that I'm showing, holoprosencephaly. So the diagrams that I'm showing you over here are the examples of holoprosencephaly. Like see, you can see over here, this is the one hemisphere over here and this is the second over here. And you can clearly see that the midline has not been formed and it is joined. So this is the one version of it. Uh, and the second one, which is way more riskier than that, is the cyclopia. You can see the eyes are fused over here. You can also see cleft palate and cleft lip in like, you know, some, uh, some, some anomalies, but it is not that risky also, the cleft lip and palate. So this is the first, uh, uh, you know, uh, the USMLE step one wants you to remember the pathology associated with the sonic hedgehog uh, gene. So you need to remember this, this is very much important. And uh, this is the thing that you need to remember of sonic hedgehog. Now let's go about the next one, which is known as there is something known as apical ectodermal ridge. Now, what does apical ectodermal ridge do? You know, it is very much critical for the proximal to distal development. Now, what is the proximal to distal? See, this is the proximal and this is the distal. So, anything that develops like, for example, uh, this center point is the embryo. This center point is the embryo. So, now, what will the uh, apical ectodermal ridge do? It will lay out a path for the growth of proximal to the distal side. And if this, uh, you know, uh, apical ectodermal ridge is not laid upon, then the limb will stop growing. Means for example, up to this point, the apical ectodermal ridge AER was laid. Now, if it goes away from this side, then the limb will only have this much length. It will not grow further, right? 
So this is what the apical ectodermal ridge means. Now what will the ecto, uh, apical ectodermal ridge do? It has a key transcription factor which is the FGF which is a fibroblast growth factor. Now you know what will happen, uh, many times it also happens like for example this is the AER and after coming to a certain point over here the AER is lost and the FGF takes over. So in this case normal growth will continue, no anomaly will occur. So FGF and AER both have the same role which is the proximal to distal development. Now let's talk about the next one which is the WNT7A. So the, what does WNT7A do? It, it, it depends on multiple genes. It has, you know, uh, multiple genes are there, but the key role for uh, the dorsal ventral development is the WNT7A gene. So, you know, it is key for the dorsal development, Main, mainly the dorsal development. So what does it do? W, once WNT7A gets uh, transcribed, it will go and activate LMX1. Just remember, no, there is no need to remember the full form of the, these. So it will activate LMX1 gene. Now what will uh, happen that uh, once it gets dorsalized, there is development of the dorsal side. For example, this is the dorsal side, right? So you also need to develop that part from the ventral side. This I'm just showing you a schematic. So for the dorsal side, you already have WNT7A. For the ventral side, you need one another uh, transcription factor, which is engrailed one. So these both have, you know, like uh, an opposite way. So uh, if you have some doubt, like which is the dorsal and which is the ventral, so in short, I will tell you that the dorsal side means the extensors and the ventral side means the flexors, right? So this is very much that you should uh, remember. And for example, if the WNT7A gene goes missing, then both sides there will be ventral development that is uh, engrailed will be expressed. And if uh, the engrailed uh, one is not uh, expressed, then both sides the dorsal development will occur. This is the point that you should know very well. And the next one that you need to Okay, so the last embryonic gene that we are going to see is the Hox gene or the homeobox gene. So, you know, it is the main regulator for the AP axis development. We, we discussed previously, right? The anterior post posterior uh, axis development. And, uh, you know, uh, if there is any mutation in this, then uh, the body segments will have uh, gross anomalies. And many a times what happens that, uh, for example, uh, these two uh, parts have to be, you know, fused to be one. And if there is an anomaly in the Hox gene, these two parts can lead to an additional part and it can lead to syndactyly like thing. I'll show the photo of syndactyl um, in the next uh, image. And uh, you need to remember one very important concept, which pathology is associated to abnormal limb formation you need to remember this it's very important if there is any mutation in the limbs just remember it is due to hox gene you can see over here that uh, this person uh, this person has additional little finger over here and this is known as polydactyl this is known as polydactyl plus syndactyl syndactyl means that this is fused and this is an additional segment right so this is the end of the embryonic genes. Now we will talk about the very important concept, which is embryogenesis. So you know what happens in embryogenesis, right? It is the for, uh, it is the process of fertilization when uh, one haploid ovum and one haploid sp spermatozoa both fuses down to form the zygote. So in in the zygote formation, you need to remember that the DNA synthesis occurs so that the chromatid material, that is the DNA, will get multiplied. That is 4C from which the daughter cell originates, which is 2N and 2C. So, the main important concept of uh, embryogenesis begins from here that once the zygote implants itself in the fallopian tube, the morula formation is going to occur. Now, what is basically a morula? So, if this is a cell, this is like a morula, like uh, the division of cells occur and uh, after morula formation occurs, it results in one uh, blastocyst. So blastocyst is something like this. And uh, this is an imaging 
showing the blastocyst and and in the blastocyst you need to be very much aware of what the layers are means they will ask you that what is this structure over here sorry what is this structure over here and they will also ask that what is the lining of this and what is this so basically this is the embryoblast embryoblast will give rise to all types of cells uh, whether it be of a cell of head or a cell of limb etc and this outer cell outer cells are the trophoblast and the, this one is the blastocele so you need to remember this is the blastocele this is the trophoblast and you, and uh, why is the blastocyst such an important structure because uh, once a blastocyst has formed uh, around 5 to 6 day around 6 to 10 days the blastocyst will go and implant into into the uterus now this is my uterine lining for example and the blastocyst uh, blastocyst comes and uh, implants over here so as soon as the blastocyst implants it starts secreting beta hcg now in hcg there are two components alpha and beta in which the beta hcg component rises in pregnancy so only after 6 to 10 days the level of beta hcg in the blood increases so many a times you know you see couples complaining that uh, no we checked the pregnancy test at that time the test was negative then how come the test is positive right now so it occurs when you know uh, the couple has tested for pregnancy at home in the first five to six days uh, this form uh, this problem can occur and once the blasto blastocyst implants after some time a formation of placenta occurs so the takeaway point from this is that you cannot test positive for pregnancy for at least seven days because hcg secretes after eight days and thus, after the after the HCG secretion starts, gastrulation will occur. And what is gastrulation? The gastrulation is a formation of the three germ layers, that is ectoderm, endoderm, and uh, and the mesoderm, right? And the uh, and after the gastrulation has begun, there are two layers with, uh, in which it uh, in which the cell divides. One is the epiblast, and one is the hypoblast. The epiblast will go and form the embryo, whereas uh, the hypoblast will go and develop into an yolk sac. Now, what is this structure present over here? So, this structure is the primitive streak. Now, why is primitive streak a very important embryological uh, structure? Because this this line this line which you see over here, this is the uh, vis the visible streak in the blastocyst. Means once this streak appears, then it is for sure that the gastrulation has begun. So, this is very important. You need to remember this. So, so now let's talk about genital embryology. So uh, during fertilization, uh, the determination of chromosomal sex has already been occurred that with, whether the uh, person is XY or XX. So right, right, so XY will be a male and XX will be a female, right? So that is just the, you know, chromosomal determination. But how does our genital system develop after the determination of chromosomes? So uh, during the later development, uh, our genital system develops and the, uh, the genital system uh, development occurs in three ways. First one is the development of gonads. Second one is internal genitalia development and third one is external genitalia. So all the all these three structures derive from different structures and that their way of origin and development is quite different from each other. So whenever we are talking about the genital system embryology, uh, each of these should be considered as different from each other. So let's start by the development of gonads. So how does the go uh, gonadal development occur? So what happens that, uh, uh, you know, uh, after gastrulation has occurred, one structure originates, which is known as the epiblast. So from epiblast the germ cells start uh, 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 deriving and that germ cells comes and invades the gonadal ridges now invasion of the gonadal ridges is very important for the development of the gonads now if if there is failure to reach over here then what will happen that gonads will be will not be differentiating now what does this mean uh, gonads will not be differentiating what does this mean that you know what happens that uh, originally like if this is a male uh, if this is a male gonad and if this is a female gonad then these both structures are so similar to each other that you cannot differentiate between them one needs to uh, one of these needs to invade the gonadal ridges so that it can you know uh, develop further 
so this is uh, the development of gonads so now let's talk about the data uh, how does the internal genitalia are developed so first of all you need to know that which structures are considered as the internal genitalia so epididymis vas deferens and seminal vesicles are the internal structures of male genital system fallopian tubes uterus and upper vagina these are parts of the internal genitalia so how does this development occur for the internal genitalia so for for that you need to be aware of one thing which is the s r y gene so what happens is that in males there is presence of s r y gene so uh, this is it, is, it can uh, it is especially for y chromosome right so what happens is that if the if s s r y gene is present over here it will then code for testis determine de determining factor so due to presence of f r y gene this will lead to formation of formation of sertoli cells and leydig cells and we very well know that these two cell uh, these two cells are very much important for the development of uh, of uh, of the genital system whether it is during reproductive age or during puberty these are the key cells of the male reproductive system so what will happen that once these these both structures will form testosterone formation can occur and due to that what will happen for this testosterone to develop this will cause male development afterwards so for this testosterone to develop the initial structures will be uh, will be uh, made and these initial structures are known as the medullary cords so in short what what i am trying to say over here is the sry gene presence of sry gene leads to formation of medullary cords and due to the medullary cords testosterone will get developed in later age during the puberty and from that uh you know a male development can occur uh, after puberty that we talk about right so this is the uh, thing of the internal genitalia of males now what will happen in the uh, internal genitalia of females like in ovary right so what will happen at that time in ovary that uh, uh we know that sry gene will be absent in it so as uh, due to the absence of sry gene uh there will be no formation of no formation of medullary cords so what will happen a new a new type of cords originate in females and these are the cortical cords and cortical cords what do they do they form clusters like this so these clusters later on form oogonia and follicular cells so this is the part that you should be very very well versed with that how does the formation this the, the cortical cords in females and the medullary cords in males so that is like the point which you should, which you should know very well so this is the thing of the internal uh, internal genitalia right so still uh, internal genitalia also depends on the other things which is known as uh, there are two types of ducts first one is the mesonephric ducts which is also known as the wolfian duct and the second one is paramesonephric which are which is known as the mullerian so again uh, you know as uh, as we talked about in the previous thing that sry gene indicates the uh, indicates the development of male development right so what happens in in the genital duct section is that sertoli cells we know that sertoli cells who develop the sertoli cells first of all you should be if someone asks you it is the sry gene right so due to the presence of sry gene the sertoli cells develop and sertoli cells will go and release mullerian inhibitory factor which is mif so due to mullerian uh, inhibitory factor what will happen that the mullerian duct mullerian duct will regress right so wolfian duct or the mesonephric duct will develop so this is the first you know the, there needs to be two sensations like two types of stimulus for the development of the wolfian duct first one is the mullerian inhibitory factor and second th uh, this uh, mullerian inhibitory factor is done by sertoli cells and the second one is that the leydig cells 
will secrete androgens. So androgens will release more testosterone and due to more testosterone, more uh, the development of wolf and duck will occur. More stimulation will, uh, more stimulation will reach to the mesonephric ducts, right? So this is the first part. Now what will happen in females? In females, the thing is that in females, uh, there is no Mullerian inhibitory factor because no Sertoli cells or no uh, no Leydig cells. So no Mullerian inhibitory factor. So no regression can occur. So no regression will occur. And apart from that, there is, there are no there is no presence of the uh, Leydig cells. So no androgens. No androgens, right? So uh, due to that reason, uh, the the Mullerian ducts will persist. And this will lead to formation of the internal genitalia for the females. So in short, uh, in short, you just need to remember one thing that in males after uh, in males, there's a small Mullerian remnant, which you will see. This is very important that this you should know it very well, right? And in females, there is a small Wolfian remnant. Okay, so there is one pathology associated with this the uh, with this concept, which is the Gartner's duct. Now, what is Gartner's duct? Uh, what happens is uh, that in females there is some Wolfian remnant. So uh, it is found in on the vaginal wall. If like this is the vagina. There is somewhere a Gartner's duct is present. It is not visible because it is an internal structure, but this can cause cyst formation, right? So you should remember this very nicely. So if we sum, uh, if we talk about a summary of the development of internal genitalia, so this is the Mullerian duct, this is the Wolfian duct. So here, if testos, if SRY testosterone and Mullerian inhibitory factor or stimulation is there, then the development of the internal genitalia will occur, which is a seminal vesicle, vasodifference, or epididymis, right? And if these structures are not present, that is, if they are absent over here, then the, uh, the internal genitalia of female will develop, that is, uterus, cervix, upper vagina, and ovaries, right? And remember Gartner's duct, okay? Gartner's duct is very much important. And Gartner's duct will somewhere occur over here in the upper vagina structure. Okay, so after completing the internal genitalia, we will now be looking at the external genitalia. So for external genitalia, the main structure is the urogenital sinus, right? So for the development of urogenital sinus, this development occurs from the cloaca. And the urogenital sinus then goes on forming the, uh, the structures in both the male and female genital system however it is going to be different but the main the main important key role is urogenital sinus so uh, the in males the urogenital sinus the upper part forms the bladder the middle part forms the prostate and the prostatic urethra and the lower part forms the penile urethra or uh, or known as the uh, penis and in females the upper part of urogenital sinus forms the bladder the pelvic portion forms the inferior vagina and uh, it also helps in connection with the mullerian duct so this uh, so this urogenital sinus is very much important for determining the external genitalia and uh, now let's talk about one thing which is known as the uterine anomalies so uh, what happens in the females that there is one this is the left mullerian duct and this is the right mullerian duct so from the both sides, the left as well as the right Mullerian duct, it is very much important that they both fuse together. And once it is fused, it forms the normal uterus. So this is what the normal embryology is about. But what happens over here that uh, there are many types of, uh, you know, uterine anomalies. First one, the most common one is the, the lateral fusion defect. So what occurs over here? That in normal, in normal, what happens is that, that this, if this is the cavity we are talking about, then the whole, the both, uh, the both sides of the Mullerian duct will, will combine and it will form a, something like this, uh, this structure. But what will happen in this, that, uh, like, and this is known as aseptate. The normal uterus that we see is the aseptate uterus. The septa will only form if the lateral uh, ends do not fuse. So this is the first point. 
now uh, now there is one second uh, type of anomaly which is also very common and that is known as the natural side so what happens in that that if this is my cavity and what happens is some some structure like this occurs so here the fusion has uh, not occurred and this is because resorption of the mullerian part has not occurred over here resorption of the mullerian fusion so septate septation is present and to re remove this septation you need to perform a septoplasty so this is a very important thing you need to remember with the uterine anomalies and yes uh, there is one type of uterine anomaly that uh, that we forgot to discuss and this is also of very great importance you should remember the name the name is very much important it is the by it is the uterine didelphus Now what happens in uterine didelphus that uh, from one side one uterus will originate and from the second one uh, the second uterus will so this is like two uterine structures this will be the one mullerian duct over here which gives rise to one uterus and the second one will give to second so there are, there are presence of two uterus over here so now the main important part is the structures the structures of the development of the external genitalia so when we talk about the structures you should be very much aware about the first one is the genital tubercle second one is the urogenital sinus urogenital folds and labioscrotal swellings now why are these structures important because uh, when we talk about the development of external genitalia we will be talking about the development like we talked in the in this part that uh, the development of bladder is occurring, prostate is occurring, prostatic urethra is occurring or the penal urethra is occurring, right? So, whenever we are talking about the development of particular parts, we should know that which structure is giving origin to that particular part. So, now let's discuss what is the basic orientation of all these embryological derivatives which will give rise to various parts. So basically, see, you need to, uh, you know, uh, make two points of references. First one is going to be the genital tubercle over here. Second one is going to be the anus. So just beneath the genital tubercle, you are going to witness the urogenital sinus over here. And around the urogenital sinus, you will notice there are two folds which are known as the urogenital folds. Now, urogenital sinuses and folds both originate from the cloaca. And around them, is, you can find the last part, which is the labioscrotal swelling. Now, out of all these parts, you need to remember one thing that in males, the genital tubercle will elongate to form penis. Whereas in females, it will elongate to form the clitoris. And we know that both are homologous structures. In males, the, the, uh, the urogenital sinus is going to, uh, going to close. Uh, whereas in the females, it will remain open for vagina. So these are the important points that you should know. Okay, so once we have discussed the important points, now we will see that first of all, we will say in males that which structure is giving rise to which part of the uh, male reproductive system. So the genital tubercle will elongate and it will give rise to the penis, right? Now, always remember one thing that all the uh, urogenital sinus, the urogenital sinus, whether it is male or female, will always give rise to glands. And in this context, as it is, we are discussing about male, it will give rise to two things. First one is the prostate gland. And second one is the glands of copper. So uh, both the secretions are, you know, uh, seen in the ejaculation. And labioscrotal swelling will give rise to the scrotum. And the urogenital folds, it will also form the penile urethra. So these are the derivatives that we talk about male. Okay, so now we will be discussing about females. So in this, you need to remember the important thing that in genital tubercle, uh, it will form the clitoris. Now, urogenital sinus, as I talked about, will give rise to glands. Over here, it will give rise to bathroom gland. Many a times, the bathroom cyst occurs in uh, females. And uh, it also gives rise to the para-urethral glands. Okay, that's that's not that important but the next two points are very important mm -hmm. the labioscrotal swellings will rise give rise to labia majora and the urogenital folds they will not fuse 
and as they will not fuse they will give rise to the labia minora so that's the end of genital embryology so that's all that's all for today's class uh, thank you so much